On any given day, 300 million people around the world are on their menstrual period. And some of you have questions. Ruby says, can you talk about the bounds of what a normal period is? It would be really nice to have a doctor we trust talk about the bounds of not anything to worry about versus you should see a doctor. Of course, I know you can't give us specific medical advice. That is true. All of this is just information for you to take into your brain and let it prompt a conversation with your doctor or advanced practice provider. I do go over this a little bit in the other video, but basically from a volume standpoint, if it's enough blood to interfere with your emotional, physical, or social life, then it's too much and you can bring it up with us. That's really the parameter we're supposed to use for deciding if your periods are too heavy. There is a technical definition of that over 80 milliliters, but that is obviously a lot more complicated to discern if that's happening and also a lot less useful because if someone is bleeding that much, but it's not bothering them, they don't have anemia, whatever, then why is that a problem? How much it bothers you is the parameter for volume. As far as regularity, anywhere from about 24 to 38 days, and that's from cycle day one, first day of bleeding to the day before your next period, 24 to 38 days is considered normal. Some variation in that is okay. They don't have to be exactly 34 days apart every single time, but pretty close to regular. And if they aren't coming at a pretty consistent interval, then that's something to bring up with us as well. There were several questions about this. Actually, someone says, can you talk about what is a normal level of pain? I kind of go about this the same way as the heaviness one. It shouldn't be pain that interferes with your ability to live your life. If it is, then we need to talk about it because your period pain shouldn't keep you from doing anything that you want to do. If it's more than a fleeting, oh man, period cramps, then it's probably at least worth bringing up. I've seen a lot of these TikToks and things that say period pain, like having pain on your menstrual cycle is not normal. Like you should be completely pain-free. I don't really think that I agree with that. The physiology of how cycles happen and the hormones you produce they cause cramping. So some degree of a little bit of mild discomfort, especially if it's not interfering with your life, is normal. I mean, that doesn't mean if you don't have pain at all, it's abnormal or something's wrong with you. It just means if you do have a little pain, it doesn't mean anything's wrong. Your period should not interfere with your ability to live your day-to-day -day life. And that is a take-home message for all of these, what's normal, what's not, it shouldn't interfere with your ability to live life. I often experience pain when I ovulate, which can be worse than my period cramps, which tend to be very light. I always assumed ovulation was something that happened rather quickly within minutes, but judging from my pain, it's closer to hours or even days. Could you talk about the process of ovulation in more detail? This is a really good question. So there's a word for this called middle schmerz, middle pain, middle of the cycle, middle of the body. I don't know, it's a German word. The process of ovulation is probably not what's causing your pain. It probably is related to the fluid that can gather in the pelvis after ovulation, so immediately after. Some people may have some discomfort related just to the development of that ovulation site, but most of the time when you're having ovulation pain and bloating and things like that mid-cycle, it's going to be because of fluid. The ovary kind of recruits and spills out into the pelvis. Even a very small amount of fluid or blood, and in the case of ovulation could be either or both, in the pelvis or around the intestines and things like that is extremely uncomfortable for your body. Your body does not like fluid or blood being inside the abdomen. The actual ovulation event is instantaneous. So once it is triggered, it just happens. That's why the pain goes on for a few days and some people, or at least a few hours, while your body reabsorbs that fluid and gets it out of the pelvis. Oh, this is a really interesting one. So Linda Beth Cave says, can you talk about how menstrual hormones impact mental health? I have ADHD and seasonal affective disorder and the luteal phase is always so much more rough than the first half of my cycle. I've taken to calling them the light side and the dark side of my menstrual cycle. This is a really interesting question because it actually gets at a topic that I find fascinating, which is PMS and PMDD or premenstrual dysphoric disorder. The process of ovulation, like we talked about in the last video, causes you to have a corpus luteum cyst on your ovary. So that ovulation site turns into a progesterone producing cyst. And that increase in progesterone and a relative lower amount of estrogen compared to progesterone at that point in the cycle, the second half of the cycle, causes some people to be real sensitive. Not sensitive like your mood, but like some people are more sensitive to that hormone change. Progesterone increasing has a loop effect of causing a decrease in serotonin receptors. So up here in your brain, even if you have a stable good amount of serotonin, there's less receptors to read it. In some people, even just that can cause 
an increase in their anxiety and depression symptoms, worsening mood symptoms, etc. But it also increases something called monoamine oxidase B, enzyme that breaks down serotonin. So at the same time you're decreasing how many places on your brain serotonin can be acknowledged, you are also increasing how fast the serotonin molecules floating around go away so you have less serotonin and less places for it to be read. This is likely to trigger mood symptoms. So it is really common that the second half of the cycle or the luteal phase is a point where people have more mood symptoms. You also bring up ADHD, which I also have, and despite that, have never looked into data on this, but I suspect that if data does exist, it agrees with what you are subjectively feeling like you notice because there is data and interesting research on cognitive function at various points in the menstrual cycle. And certainly we see people do more poorly, so worse on cognitive tests, cognitive function tests, in the second half of the menstrual cycle. It would not shock me at all if I look into this and there's data that says people with ADHD are more likely to experience symptoms in the second half of the cycle. Now, there are other hormone changes that people can be sensitive to at various points in the cycle. So for some people, it's a luteal phase effect. And for other people, they may have the effect right before menstrual cycle, which is when that progesterone suddenly drops because they react to a sudden drastic change. Some people may have that during the actual days of menses. So everybody is a little bit different, but overall, when we're talking about progesterone, how sensitive your body is to it and how it affects the serotonin in your brain, I find this topic very interesting and yes, second half is the dark side for many people. That's actually a really nice bridge into the next question. And Manda says, are you familiar with PMDD and the awfulness that many women like myself suffer from around our period? PMS, most people know, some people get bloating, some people get um, pain in their breasts, some people get mood symptoms, some people don't have any symptoms at all. PMDD is a kind of extreme of that, but it, it can be a incredibly debilitating. So PMDD stands for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And in some people, they will get very significant mood changes. So severe depression. I've seen people who become suicidal only in that point of their menstrual cycle. I've seen people who are nearing psychosis only in those specific times of their menstrual cycle. So yes, I'm definitely familiar with PMDD. I agree, that would be a great topic. There are some treatments for it, one of which being selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. For the same reason that we talked about in the last question, we have a very distinct understanding of why they help. The progesterone increasing, like I said in the last question, decreases serotonin receptors and also decreases how much serotonin is floating around. I won't go into how all this works, but it, it increases serotonin levels, so an SSRI increases serotonin levels. For PMDD, you can actually give it cyclically, so only from the time of ovulation for the two weeks until menses, and can be quite effective when taken that way. So yeah, I, I will say it again, I agree. We should make a video on PMDD, PMS, and also on ADHD and the menstrual cycle. Could you please talk about effective pain management for periods and just what level of pain is no longer normal? Pain management varies widely. We have a few things that we know are evidence-based. That would be things like heat, heat packs, a TENS unit can be very effective, and over-the-counter medications. A common question I get of what kind of medication should I take, you know, we have Panadol or Tylenol or acetaminophen or ibuprofen or aspirin, or, you know, what am I using, what should I use? Overall, the studies are conclusive across the board that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are going to be the best for just basic mild period cramps. They actually decrease some of the hormones that cause the cramping, and that's why they work a little bit better than things like Tylenol. Can you talk about how your periods might change leading up to menopause? We actually refer to this as perimenopause because it doesn't just include the time before menopause, but the time immediately after your cycle stop. Menopause is when you stop having periods and it's been a full year since you've had a period. Importantly, in the absence of a reason for that. So you can't be pregnant and breastfeeding, that's not menopause. You can't be um, taking continuous birth control pills, that's not menopause, right? So in the absence of other proven reasons, one year without a period is menopause. The time between kind of leading up to that final menstrual period and the days, months, weeks, after until you're at that year, this is the perimenopausal phase. What we generally see is cycles get more erratic, less predictable, often lighter, but in some people heavier. They can be more frequent in some people, so 
a lower amount of bleeding for fewer days, uh, but closer together. It kind of mimics when you first start having periods in your teen years because, or earlier for a lot of people, because it's kind of this dysregulation of the HPO axis, which we talked about in the last video. Your brain's just not quite as effectively communicating with your ovaries, mainly because your ovaries are needing a whole lot more of those gonadotropins to actually produce an ovulation site because the number of ovulation sites, oocytes left is getting quite low. That's kind of why it happens and what can go on. And then obviously there's all kinds of symptoms associated with menopause and perimenopause, which yes, I agree. We need a menopause video. So we'll work on that as well. I've read various opinions about how the relationships between athletic performance and stages of the menstrual cycle correlate. I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. I mean, I would assume there's some correlation here. I actually don't know the data a whole lot on this one. So why don't we also add that for a full video at some point. I would love to see how extensively that is affected. I've read some news articles on it, but I need to look up the primary literature. I'll look up something really quick. There is a narrative review that came out recently. I will read through all of this and we will make a video. That's a very interesting topic. But basically what they're saying is that based on the physiology and how we know the body works and other things that the menstrual cycle can affect, like we were talking about earlier, cognitive performance, memory recall, mood, motivation, things like that, that there's every reason to think that it would also affect performance, but we don't really know if it's mental space is being affected and that affects your performance or if there is an actual effect on your like physical performance level. Does that make sense? So this looks like a really interesting article. I'm going to save it and we'll do a whole video. Another common question I get that I don't see clipped out here, but I do want to answer really quick is asking if clots are normal. Clots during your cycle can be normal. The problem becomes when you are having like really, really heavy bleeding and big clots, even up to probably golf ball size clots occasionally. And in the absence of super heavy bleeding paired with that can be normal. And the reason is because the vagina is a potential space. So it generally sits closed, but it can gather things in it, you know, things. It's not a purse or a pouch to store things. When I say it can gather things, I mean, if the blood pulls in there and then coagulates, it can kind of find a little place to sit. And then when you stand up or roll over or go to the bathroom, a clot can come out. That is okay because that's a normal space that clots can gather. But if on top of that, you're having super, super heavy bleeding, especially if it's interfering with your life, then, then that's not normal. So the presence of clots themselves are not necessarily a bad thing. It can just be your anatomy, how you were sitting, you know, how your body is made is more likely to have that blood pool in the vagina, sit there until it coagulates and come out as a clot rather than kind of coming out as a liquid blood. So yes, clots can be normal. They can also be abnormal. So now that that's clear as menstrual blood, I'll see you next Monday. Oh my God, it's so hot in here. I'm dying. I'm gonna melt.